Professor Feldman is a graduate of UC Davis, uh, went to get his PhD from Harvard, and then came to Berkeley with a, for a postdoc. Then he joined faculty um, in the Department of Botany, now it's called the Department of Plant and uh, Microbial Biology, where he spent his entire academic career um, but before coming um, as a director of the uh, Botanical Garden a year ago. Um, he is a plant developmental biologist and his research has focused in, in brief on root development, much more detail to that, but root development in general. He's a longtime advocate uh, for the garden. He also serves as a longtime instructor in Berkeley's large introductory, introductory biology class uh, with over 750 students. His main interest as director of the botanical garden is to ensure that plant um, the plant collection is curated and well managed. It involves and it involves raising funds to maintain and update their facilities for caring for uh, plants. Additionally, as director, he works to promote garden activities and conservation, education, and research. It's also known to me that he encourages students that when they when they are on campus and they go back for winter break or that they can bring their plants to the um, to the botanical garden to uh, be kept safely while they are away uh, from campus. So uh, I can't wait to hear what uh, Professor Feldman has to share. And so welcome, please. Okay, so here we go. Share screen. Great. And. Uh... How's that? You got it? It's there. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, everybody for this opportunity to meet with you and to talk about the Botanical Garden. Uh, it's not, uh, you don't have to twist my arm to talk about the garden. The garden, uh, as most of you know, is located in Strawberry Canyon. We're now open. Uh, we have uh, some safety guidelines which we follow and it is, uh, makes the garden a very safe place, a very uh, beautiful place to come. And I want to encourage those of you who want to get out and uh, get some fresh air and have yourself in a beautiful setting to come up to the garden. You have to make online reservations and that can be done by going to the garden webpage. So uh, as uh, uh, Carrie has mentioned, I have uh, come to the garden as a director after having been a faculty member. I still am a faculty member for more than 40 years on the campus. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. And what I would like to do today is to introduce the garden to some of you who may not have uh, any, any knowledge of it. And at the same time, encourage some of you who are reluctant to come up to think about visiting and also to perhaps uh, give some new pieces of information to those of you who have visited the garden before, uh, but may not uh, have a, a setting for this uh, beautiful place as far as the work is concerned. So the mission of the garden I'd like to just touch on, is, which was mentioned a bit uh, by Kerry, is to develop and to maintain a diverse collection of plants and support the university's mission in teaching and in worldwide research. We also have a large effort, which I'll mention at the end, in conservation. And uh, my uh, real emphasis in coming up here, aside from curating the collection, is to promote an understanding and an appreciation of plants in the natural environment. And I'll talk more about this topic as we move through the slides. So why have a botanical garden? And the answer is that the simple, the simple answer is, is that our future as humans depends upon us partnering with plants. If we as a, a human society are going to survive, we're going to have to begin to partner with nature in a way that we haven't done before. And that partnering will allow us to deal with climate change and with the changes in the weather as far as water is concerned. And it will only be achieved by educating the public, by educating individuals about the importance of plants and of the natural environment uh, to their lives. Most of us are later in our years and we're not going to be around to experience what's going to turn out to be drastic changes in our climate. Uh, so we wanna really think about future generations and this is uh, my main goal, which has to do with education. It's really why I came to the garden. So in this time of climate change, uh, the garden has a great function, a great role. It serves as a resource for the life history. That is the plants that we have growing here, which I'll talk to you about in a moment. Uh, we know a lot about their life history. We know a lot about the environments in which they grew. And it's also a place for maintaining uh, many plants which are endangered and many plants which are extinct in the environments that they actually were originally from. 
And in that sense, the botanical garden, to my mind, serves as a kind of Noah's Ark. So this is an outline of the talk. I, I promised uh, uh, Betsy and Carrie that I would try and limit the talk to 40 minutes to allow times for questions or for comments that you might have. I'd like to tell you a bit about the history of the facilities, talk about our collections, talk about the topic which I mentioned earlier, which is conservation, and then to end by discussing a bit about teaching and research, uh, which is a, a topic close to my heart. Now the Botanical Garden, uh, as some of you may know, was established by one of the first departments here on campus in 1890. And it was established by this man, Professor Green. And uh, Professor Green uh, established the first botanical garden in a section of the campus, uh, which is sort of pictured here in this poor picture, and I'll show you where it is. And this is a garden that began in 1890, and you can see some of the stakes, some of the small plants. The garden uh, was growing from about 1890 to about the uh, 1920s, 1925, when it was first established, it was kind of on the periphery of the whole campus. But as the campus enlarged, it began to approach uh, the garden and the land the garden occupied became uh, endangered because it wanted to, they wanted to use it for other resources. The garden in about 1920 or 25 looks sort of like this. Uh, we are now approaching our 130th birthday, having been established uh, in 1890. And uh, here in the upper right-hand corner here, you can see the first uh, telescope facility on campus. This region over here, to orient you, had on it a greenhouse, and I'll show you where that was on the campus. And that greenhouse has long ago uh, been destroyed when the campus moved into this area and built classrooms. But if you want to know what that greenhouse was like, all you need to do is go to Golden Gate Park, and there's a larger sort of replica of the greenhouse which existed in the Botanical Garden about uh, 1900. The spot in which the Botanical Garden which was formerly on campus is now occupied by the East Asian Library. So this is where the garden was located before. And uh, when the East Asian Library was being constructed, as they dug down into the ground, they found some artifacts uh, from this for this early botanical garden. And in fact, there are still a couple of trees uh, right behind Moffat Library. For those of you who drive the split road behind Moffat Library, there are a couple of trees left over from that original botanical garden down from the, uh, the School of Social Welfare and uh, from the East Asian Library. So there are some remnants, but by and large, the botanical garden has disappeared, at least it's most of its buildings, all of its buildings have disappeared from the central campus. So the garden moved up to Strawberry Canyon in the 1920s. Strawberry Canyon, where the garden is now located, was a dairy farm. And uh, there are some buildings that still exist in the botanical garden from the dairy farm. And this is the way the area looked uh, at that time. Uh, I've been told that before this time that the hills had more trees on them, but they were gradually cleared in order to make pastures for animals to feed. Uh, this is the garden uh, at his, as it appeared uh, in the early 1900s. This shows you a landslide uh, at the dairy farm. Um, for those of you who have been to the garden, uh, you'll be aware of the grassy area, the lawn. This is the way that area looked when the garden uh, first moved up here. This is the portion in which we now have uh, a lawn and uh, many plants planted around it. Uh, this is a 1935 view of the area that the Botanical Garden occupied where we have a WPA uh, housing project located uh, in a portion of the garden. Here is the football stadium to orient you. And uh, this group of individual huts here house workers, some of whom I'm told actually did some work in the garden, helping to construct uh, walls and some of the pathways. So since 1996, uh, the Botanical Garden uh, has been administered through the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research. And the garden is part of the Campus uh, Natural History Museum Consortium. And that consists of the Museum of Entomology, Zoology, Anthropology, Paleontology, University Herbaria, and the Botanical Garden. And most of you probably don't know this fact, but when you take all of these museums and you group them together, aside from the Smithsonian Museums in Washington, these collection of museums represent the single largest collection of natural history museums in the United States. Quite remarkable to think that Berkeley houses uh, these types of museums. Now, what is the garden not? 
the garden, the botanical garden at Berkeley is not a display garden. It's gardens uh, like this, which house uh, tulips and beautiful bulbs are certainly a restful and beautiful place to be, but that is not uh, the UC Berkeley Botanical Garden. Our garden is a specimen garden. It is a garden which has plants from all continents on the earth, from the nine geographical regions. We have some very special collections, which I'll talk about. We have uh, 13,000 different kinds of plants, and we have 20,000 different accessions, that is 20,000 plants which have been introduced to the garden at various times. Now, what makes this garden so special, as I'll show you in some slides, and I'd like to just put this out here now, and makes it actually unique in, in the United States and most of the world, is that almost 80% of the plants which we have growing in the garden were collected from where they actually grew or seed from which we have the plants in the garden was collected in, in the natural environment. So we know a lot about the soils, about the plants that were growing with the plants we have in the garden, about the climate. And most importantly, we know that the genetic stock of the plants which we have in the garden match the wild plants that were growing at the time these plants were collected. So this is a very, very unusual garden. Most gardens do not have the data, the information about the plants in their collection. And this garden is heavily used by researchers who want to get the genetic stock of the plants. I, I will say to you right now that given the way biology is on this campus and at most other places, that there isn't a lot of interest on the part of faculty in the collections. And that's because most faculty today in biology do molecular biology. They generate large pieces of data. But what I, and so that they don't really use the botanical garden except occasionally to get a specimen plant. But what I wanna say to everybody out there in the audience is that although the garden is not now heavily used by faculty, that all these databases that are being accumulated and data which is being uh, curated in large amounts, ultimately, if it's gonna make sense, it has to be brought back to the organism. And when that time comes, it may be 10 or 15 or 20 years from now, Berkeley is going to be uniquely placed among institutions in the world because we have the plants to which you can then bring back these databases. It's a very, very, uh, speaks highly of the campus that they're willing to invest in maintaining this garden. So if we look at some of the, uh, the top parts about the garden compared to other places, it's one of the top three most diverse collections in the United States. As I said, most of our plants are wild collected. It's one of the top gardens in the world. And this is really unique because the gardens that we're comparing ourselves to are usually uh, gardens of uh, countries or gardens of the governments. Ours is a garden of the university. It is a unique garden. And to compare it, as you will see, to some of these larger gardens, these larger gardens are really the garden of the country that they are in. And the important point to make, which has been made to me by many of our volunteers, is that in the Bay Area, uh, we can grow a large number of plants uh, in the botanical garden. And as a result, most of our plants, as I will point out to you later on, are grown outside. That also makes this garden unique. Perhaps only the Huntington Garden in Southern California can match us in the number of plants which can be grown outside. So if you look at uh, some tables, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, these are some of the gardens that which are, we compare ourselves to in the US or in Canada. And what I wanna point out to you is most of these gardens are gardens of municipalities. And this is really the only garden uh, among the top gardens in the United States, which is a university garden. And notice, although we aren't the top one, the Missouri Botanical Garden is the top one, we are pretty close and it speaks highly uh, of Berkeley. If we look at it in a more international level, again, these are the gardens against which we are compared. These are gardens which are ones of the countries that they're in. They are the country's main garden. And yet, when you look at the collections which we have, although they aren't as large as far as the number of taxa, they still represent a significant portion of plants which we have at these municipal or federal gardens. Now, when you come to the UC Botanical Garden, as I said, we have a very special collection. And not only is the collection special because we know the information about the plants, but because we make this information available to the world on our databases. When you come to the garden, you will notice that on the signs which are uh, associated with each of the plants, uh, and this is the name and the country in which the plant grew, there is a number. This number here, the first numbers represent the year the plant was brought into the collection. And then the second numbers which appear 
it was the 1234th plant that year added to the collection. And then there's a lot of information on the plant. So these collected plants provide a tremendous amount of information to researchers and to students and uh, serve as a resource which is being used in a way that we never thought of before. This information is stored in our collections and again is um, searchable. And if you go to our webpage, uh, you don't have to be a researcher to look up plants to find out what we have here in the garden and to find out their locations. Now, Berkeley is situated in a Mediterranean climate. And as a result of being in the Mediterranean climate, we have uh, large collections of the geographic areas above and below the equator, which have Mediterranean climates. We have very rich collections of Chile and South America, of South Africa, and of Australia. And of course, the reason which is named for the Mediterranean climate, these countries which grow around the Mediterranean. Uh, the Mediterranean climate, I needn't tell you that, uh, has these characteristics, but it only represents about 2% of the land, of the surface uh, of, the, of the earth. Uh, and California, though, comprises a large percent of that 2%. And because of the similarity in the climate, plants can be exchanged uh, among these five regions. And of course, as many of you know, it's the wine growing region. We have in the garden a number of uh, nationally accredited collections. These are collections of a large number of plants which are used by organizations and which have been accredited by organizations. One of these collections is the oak collection. It's a large collection of, of oaks which we have here and they are uh, demonstrations of what the plants look like, but also provide a large amount of genetic stock for individuals who are interested in the biology of oaks. We also have a large collection of magnolias. Uh, they are beautiful plants, and I'd encourage you, if you haven't seen some of these species, to come up to the garden and to view them when they're flowering. There's a very large fern collection. We have almost 300, and we have more than 350 species of ferns many of which are growing in very dry conditions. You would not expect ferns to be found there. And so if you're interested in ferns, we sell some ferns, but we have many, many ferns growing outside. These are beautiful plants. In our Mediterranean climate, some of you might like to grow ferns in your garden. And we have a very unusual collection, which I'll come back to, uh, plants which are known as cycads. It's an interesting story about how we develop this large collection. These plants are uh, endangered in their natural habitat. And for those of you who are, are science fiction buffs or who are uh, children at heart, these are the plants that dinosaurs used to eat. Roses had not evolved yet. So if you see a dinosaur movie with roses munching on them, the guys got it wrong. These are the plants they used to eat. They don't make flowers yet. Now the botanical garden consists of about 34 acres. And I said what makes it distinctive in the world is that the Information on the plants allows us to really use it as a database. The other thing which makes this garden distinctive from all the gardens most in the world is that the plants are grouped not by how they're related to each other, but by where they grew. So our 34 acres in the botanical garden, which is uh, not very much, are divided into areas based on geographical location of the plants. So we have an area for South African plants, an area for Australasia, a California area which represents the largest area of the garden, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And an area that I'd like to encourage those of you who may have been from New England or upstate New York and, and wish that you could be back there for the fall, we have an Eastern North America area which is now just beginning to start changing leaf color. And if the nights are cool, it'll put on a spectacular display. So we have this area. It's easy to travel from one region of the world to the other from South America to the Mediterranean region by simply crossing the road. We also have an area, I said about 80% of the plants are wild collected. We also have an area where the plants are cultivars which have been collected. And perhaps the best example is the old rose area. For those of you who haven't been up there, it's a terrific area to visit. It's beautiful smell and it'll take you back uh, to your childhood if you have your grandmother grew roses in her garden. The garden, as I said, is divided into the geographical areas. You can kind of see them on the map, and this map is available. And uh, in our largest area, the California area, we represent uh, a large percent of the plants. Over 30% of the state plants are represented in the California area. And many of those plants are endangered or threatened in their natural environment. And in particular, 
we have divided the California area into the different habitats which make up California, and I'll show you them in a moment. And finally, on this map, which you didn't see on the other side, here is Centennial Drive moving up here. And on the other side of Centennial Drive, you have a large redwood grove. I want to encourage those of you who are looking for solace and peace and quiet and, and just some place to reflect on life to come up to the Redwood Grove. It is a truly uh, renewing experience to sit among these giant trees, which were planted in the late 1920s and uh, which are, are almost 100 years old and uh, which uh, can be reached so easily and give you a feeling of peace and calm uh, that you would not get by going to Muir Woods where you have to struggle to find parking and to drive to. Look at the California collection. As I said, it has about 30% of the floral, floral tax in California, and it is the largest collection of California plants in the country. We have it divided into a number of unusual or usual habitats reflecting the different habitats which we have here in California. And this is a list of some of the habitats. I'd like to show you a picture of a few of them as you might guess, uh, with the fall coming on and the end of the long dry season, many of these areas now look like they're asleep, but some of the areas, for example, the bulb area, will begin to blossom once the rains come. One area of California is called serpentine. Serpentine consists of a type of soil where the uh, plants have their roots embedded in a soil which is very poor in some of the uh, uh, minerals that plants need, and it's very enriched in some of the toxic metals. And so we have a large collection of serpentine plants growing in this area, and these plants are uh, uh, unique to California and, of course, unique to the serpentine area. We have an area representing the uh, high altitude, the alpine fell area. There are some beautiful little plants here, lovely plants which remain small, as you might expect, for alpine plants. A very unique uh, habitat in California is the vernal pool area. For those of you who drive up to Sacramento uh, during or the end of the rainy season, if you look off to your right from Highway 80, you'll find depressions in the ground. Uh, this is south of Davis. And these depressions fill with water. They're called vernal pools. And as the vernal pools uh, fill, uh, they begin to evaporate as the warm weather comes. And the evaporation is linked to the flowering of plants as the water level recedes, kind of like make a bullseye pattern. And we duplicate the vernal pools uh, artificially. This is an environment which we can make uh, by making a concrete pad, filling it with water, and then uh, planting the seed around the side. And as the water evaporates, we develop this beautiful vernal pool pattern. Another area of California, which some of you might have visited on the North Coast, is the pygmy forest. This is an area where the soil is very thin, and as a result, the plant roots cannot get very large, and the top part of the plants then become stunted, pygmy forest. And we've duplicated that area by uh, putting a layer of concrete under the ground with a very thin layer of soil. It's a beautiful area to visit. Uh, it's a, and if these trees are plants transplanted onto an area where the soil is deep, they enlarge tremendously to just show you that this is an ecological adaptation of the plants. Um, the area of the garden that's probably most spectacular on the map is South Africa. And these plants again grow in an environment which is similar to our Mediterranean environment. And they provide a spectacular show in the springtime when it becomes, your eyes become saturated with the color. So hopefully the garden will be open next spring. We weren't open last spring. And I hope those of you who really want a, a display of the color and the beauty of nature and don't want to have to travel to Southern California deserts to see this, come visit this beautiful, very um, soul, soul, soul attractive area. Here is South Africa Hill as it's known, uh, not at the prime, but closer to the prime. And these plants you can see have labels. We talk about where they come from and about uh, when they flower and something about their taxonomy. Uh, across the road from the South African area are the deserts of America. And we have a large number of plants, uh, the deserts of America, again, spectacular uh, when they flower throughout the year. Here is a view of the deserts of America. Uh, it, we have pathways going through this. And one of my goals, and so far we've been successful, is for elderly people such as myself is to install handrails down the side so we don't have people tumbling into the cacti. Uh, another area which is very rich in the garden, and in fact was the first area developed in the garden, is the Asian collection. 
Uh, as I pointed out to you, the name tags indicate the year when the plant was put into the garden. And the earliest years will be associated with very large rhododendrons, which were brought into the garden in the 1930s and uh, are giant plants, they're almost trees. They are planted around an area which is a Japanese pool. And uh, for those of you who were around during the 1920s World Fair, and I don't think many of you were, this is a lantern from that World's Fair, which was brought over to the garden. And this area around the pool is now beginning to change color as far as the leaves. And it's a very, very beautiful area. And I hope uh, if, you're, if you're able to, that you come to visit it. Here is the area you know, during a fall. It really um, is just, it, it just reaches down deep inside of you when you see it. Uh, we also have a very interesting area of the garden, uh, which consists of plants that were put in because of an association with the School of Traditional Chinese Medicine in San Francisco. Uh, this school uh, only used to show their students what the plants looked like when they were dry and dead. And they asked us if we might consider putting plants into the garden which uh, would live and they could bring their students over and show them what the live plants look like. This is a dedication to that garden. I've been told that this is very old characters in Chinese. And as you walk through the garden, you will find through the medicinal plant garden, you will find signs indicating uh, the various plants. I think I have some other pictures. Here's a sign talking to you about what the plants are used for. And then there are particular signs indicating the individual plant with the Chinese characters uh, for those of you who might read Chinese. Uh, every year, uh, we, we have a sign when people enter this medicinal plant garden and we ask them not to try the plants, not to eat them. And every year we have somebody who does sample the plants and often we have to call that, uh, an ambulance because they get palpitations or they feel a little faint. So if you come up to the medicinal plant area, although you might want to dissolve phlegm or relieve a cough, don't try the plants. We also have a large area of uh, um, uh, plants which are used as spices, and this is a beautiful area that I'd like to encourage you to come to. Uh, squeeze the leaves so you have a chance to smell some of the spices, the mints, the sages, and so forth. And here's the old rose garden, a beautiful area. We have a lot of weddings up here, and it's a wonderful place. We have benches, uh, which people actually endow, uh, scattered throughout the garden to provide you a place to sit, to contemplate, to relax, uh, to enjoy yourselves. Here is the Redwood Grove, which I talked to you about before. It's hard to believe that this is in Berkeley. So many people are uh, amazed and impressed that this grove, which consists of almost 500 trees, uh, is located so close to this very hard, very big urban area. And it's called the Mather Redwood Grove after Stephen Mather, who was the founder of the Park Service. I really feel that most people don't visit this grove because they don't know about it. It's really a magical place. We have an amphitheater in the Grove, and during the summer we have concerts here, uh, we have fashion shows here, and we even had bar mitzvahs here. I remember listening to one, telling it hard to believe. So this is a beautiful area to come, and it's open and available now for those of you who might want to visit the Grove. Here is a concert going on here. Here's a wedding going on in the garden, and uh, the concerts are usually always sold out, and they are usually held uh, in June, July, and August, uh, a great place uh, to spend the late afternoon. I mentioned you the garden as an ark, and it really does represent a storage of the DNA of plants. And the garden, as I said, includes many rare and endangered plants, many of which are, are almost extinct. Uh, and I, just to give you an idea of how extinction is occurring, this shows you something about the various different groups as the various organizations and government classifies them critically endangered plants, endangered or vulnerable. And if you look at these numbers here, they are significantly high. These are the number of plants from 1996 to 2010, which we're worried about. And the garden has many examples of these plants uh, which grow here. And what's happening now in the world is that biodiversity is decreasing. And it's been estimated that every day, the biodiversity, the loss to biodiversity results in the disappearance of many, many species. These are species which uh, provide medicines, which provide uh, solace, which provide the wood, many different products that humans get from plants. I wanna return now to just a collection which I said before was a special collection to tell you about the role of the garden as an ark to maybe expand upon that theme. These are the plants which I said were the cycads, the dinosaur food. And the question is, 
I mentioned to you that the garden got this big collection. How did we get this collection? Well, what happened was um, these plants, these cycads are very rare. And as you can see from this sign here, many of them are nearly or, or not, are almost extinct in their environment. And therefore, there are great uh, restrictions put on their import into the United States. We have many of these plants which were or which are nearly extinct in their environments. And the question is, how did we get them? And the answer is, we received a lot of these plants from a sting operation. What had happened was that uh, the feds uh, confiscated a large number of illegally brought in cycads from um, uh, uh, that were being imported. And these cycads uh, were given to the garden to hold and to maintain them until the trial at which the importers were convicted. And then the plants were given to the garden. Many of them had died, but also many of them still lived. And as a result, uh, these plants now populate our garden. Here you can see what the plants look like when they were illegally brought in. And some of these plants are so rare and so endangered that the price for which they sell is upwards of $50,000, hard to believe, but true. And a couple of these plants, or at least one of them, was so rare and so endangered and so expensive that it had a microchip put into it. And we were able to return the plant to its uh, no original owner uh, by scanning the microchip. Here are some of these rare cycads. We have to grow them indoors, not necessarily because of the climate, but because we're worried about people coming up to the garden and stealing them. The cycad, uh, Apicondos, they really want these plants. They love them. And uh, we, have to, we have to double do love, double locks on the doors. The other thing I want to mention about the garden is that we are highly involved in conservation activities. The garden has become involved in a number of projects to reintroduce plants that formerly grew in areas of the Bay Area. Uh, and uh, we grow these plants from seed uh, through contracts that we get through the federal government, through the state, and through some private organizations. And this gives you an example of some of the plants which we grow, and then the plants are reintroduced back to their natural environment. There's been an emphasis on Mount Diablo and Mount Tamalpais, where many plants have disappeared partly because of grazing, and uh, those plants are now being reintroduced in that environment. These are some of the organizations which sponsor uh, much of this conservation work. Here's an example of a plant which uh, was being reintroduced back to Mount Diablo. This plant uh, was last recorded, at least before it was found, in about 1920 or 25, and it was never seen again on Mount Diablo until about 2005, when this particular student discovered the plant. He brought this to the attention of the botanical garden, and we collected seed from this plant, and then grew up many of these plants, collected seed, and grew them again, and then reintroduced uh, seed and plants back to their natural environment on Mount Diablo. This is an example of the conservation activities which the garden's involved in. Another one is Delphinium bakeri, which comes from only one location in Marin County. And again, like the, uh, the baker's law, the other one, we had a um, uh, collection of the seed and we now grow up many of these plants. Uh, a third one I just wanna mention is known as the large flower fiddle neck. And this too is considered to be endangered and was uh, sponsored by a US Bureau of Reclamation funded project where the seed were collected, the few seed were collected, and then many plants uh, were grown. Uh, here you can see the plants being reintroduced uh, back into the environment. In this case, I believe it's on Mount Tamalpais, or Mount Diablo, where the plants are being reintroduced to. And uh, I wanna end, uh, hopefully, uh, to talk about uh, education. Uh, as I said, this is a major goal. I believe, again, that we only are going to uh, survive as a society uh, if we partner with plants and if we educate individuals of the importance to plants. We have a large number of Berkeley undergraduates who come up and use the garden, a large number of students from elementary schools who come up to the garden, and we have a large volunteer team which uh, turn, who turn out to be docents, they lead tours, and for those of you who might be interested in volunteering, we have over 350 volunteers at the garden doing various types of uh, jobs, uh, education, uh, sometimes uh, planting, they are propagators, they sometimes are sell things. So if any of you are interested in volunteering, uh, we have a docent program here. Uh, here's an example of some of the education opportunities. Behind one of our greenhouses, we have a large amount of papyrus which are being grown. These papyrus were planted because, uh, as some of you may know, 
in the Campanile, uh, there were stored a large number of papyri. There was a, uh, an exhibit not too long ago in the main library of the papyri of Teptunus in Egypt. And uh, the papyri had been stored in the Campanile for about 50 years. And then somebody said, you know, we ought to look to see what they said. And so they hired a papyrologist and that individual taught a class in papyri. And one of the labs that he had in the class was to show students how to make papyrus paper. And so he asked the garden to plant papyrus plants and the students would come up, harvest the papyrus as you can see here, and then make paper from it. So we wanna be actively involved in campus education. And we really feel that that's an important benefit that the campus has with the association with the botanical garden. We also have an individual, this is a man by the name of Todd Dawson, who studies tree physiology. He's particularly interested in the physiology of, physiology of trees at their tops. And in order to get to the top, you have to climb up. These are the redwood trees. And uh, here he is uh, leading a class. He's quite a character. And then we have uh, some specialized classes. Sometimes the students in architecture or landscape design will do projects up here. Here's a bridge they designed. So we're really trying to involve students. Right now, we're trying to develop an information hub at the entrance to the garden. We're gonna try and raise money for that. And we would like to involve students in designing this uh, architecture or landscape architecture students in designing this information hub, which will be used to orient the visitors in the garden. Uh, we also have a large outreach program. And uh, these are programs where we have summer camps. We didn't unfortunately have the summer camps this year. And we have uh, a lot of public programs. Uh, 6,400 people participate in these public programs. And of that number, more than half were the concerts that I mentioned to you before. There are expeditions. Expeditions now are not the same as they were in the 1930s. In the 1930s, you could travel around the world and collect at will. Now most countries place limits, uh, very strict limits on collecting in part because of the endangered plants. This is a book which was published by a former director of the garden about collecting in the Andes. This man was interested in members of the tobacco family. Now our collecting is mostly restricted uh, to uh, collections in the United States and heavily in California. And uh, for those, we still need permits, but it's much uh, less strict than going to another world, another country. So the areas that we wanna collect in are areas, again, which grow well, and an area which we have a very rich collection from, and these are from the 20s and the 30s, are from Asia, from China, uh, from the Himalayas, and we want to see if we can continue. And this is only possible by making a contacts with people who are uh, professors or otherwise workers in these areas. And I will just uh, end by talking to you about a few notable changes. For those of you who have visited the garden or may be familiar with the campus, where the business school has uh, established a new wing, formerly the footprint of that new wing was occupied by this building, which is Julia Morgan Hall, which was the senior women's hall built in 1909. Every woman on the campus in 1909 was a, who was a senior could fit into this building, just to show you uh, uh, how things have changed. This building, because it's historical, developed, uh, planned by Julia Morgan, uh, couldn't be destroyed when they wanted to put up the business school building. And so it was cut into thirds and it was moved up to the botanical garden. And it now is a part of the garden. It looks like it's been here forever. And for those of you who are interested in architecture, I'm really glad to show you what it looks like inside. Or maybe you want to just rekindle a, a memory of the time when you may have been here, not in 1909, but later on. And last, I just want to end by talking about running a garden. Most of our money for the garden is generated by uh, activities. We receive very little money from the campus, maybe only 15% of our budget. And this is where our expenses come to. Most of our expenses are in salaries and in benefits as for any campus unit with a small percent for supplies. The garden is different from practically every other unit on campus because we have to raise all of our, or more than 85% of our own budget. And so we have many activities. Uh, we host weddings, we have the concerts, uh, we have plant sales, we have admission, we have memberships. So it is something which I have to work very hard on because it is a real important activity to sustain this garden. These gives you again, some of the ideas. We also have a wonderful gift shop. And in fact, it's a very unusual gift shop. And uh, I want to encourage some of you who might be looking for gifts either for holidays coming up to, to visit the gift shop 
you will find things that you can't find anyplace else. And uh, we, of course, have plant sales. There are tours. Uh, many of the tours are free and they're conducted daily. And then we have a large number of other activities. We generate a great deal of income from the garden through weddings and through conferences. And uh, looking to the future, I just want to touch on some of the aspects that I'm involved with. Uh, we're renovating several greenhouses. Uh, we're renovating our tropical house. Uh, we received a large grant to redo the tropical house, but as it turns out, uh, with the cost that the university has, it wasn't sufficient. So we're trying to raise money to redo the heating system in this greenhouse and also to redo the pathways so that people can benefit by getting up close to the plants. Right now, plants are too far away to be used very educationally. We're updating the irrigation system. The campus is helping there. We want to expand the collection. And again, this is best done by making contacts in other countries. And I have a personal uh, investment in expanding the education and outreach programs, which I mentioned to you before. And uh, we are trying to grow our membership. So this is the Botanical Garden. It is a truly remarkable institution. We have the campus to thank for this institution. And the best way I think you can thank them is by coming here and, and experiencing it for yourself. And, and I also want to say to you that, that I'm usually here every day. And if I'm not involved in a Zoom meeting or some other activity, I'm really glad to meet you. You can just ask for me at the entrance kiosk booth. And I like to show people some of the behind the scenes operation of the garden, some of the guts of the garden that you wouldn't see uh, as you just stroll through as, a, as an ordinary visitor. So with that, I'll stop. Uh, I think it's about 40 minutes and uh, I'll be glad to take uh, comments or questions. All right, well, I'll be reading the questions for you, <laughs> Dr. Feldman. And, and actually the first one, which I partially answered because I know you can make reservations online. And so I answered that part of the question, but the same uh, questioner asked if the garden will be open during Thanksgiving week. Yes, the garden is open. The only days we really are, I think we may be closed Thanksgiving day, but we are uh, closed uh, on Christmas on July 4th, I think that's the only one. But what I wanna to say to you is check our webpage because the webpage changes daily. Uh, for example, although we're open, we had to close some days when the smoke uh, reached a certain level of pollution. So what we're trying to do, because we were closed for so long during the summer, uh, we're actually trying to be open longer uh, than we were uh, trying to, we used to close two, Tuesday, two Tuesdays a month so the horticulture staff could get in and do some work in the garden. And we've done away with that. So please check the webpage and that'll tell you when we're open. Okay. Um, now I know there are docent tours, but how does one join a tour Yes. Do you have to come as a group or can you come right. as an individual? So there, there are really two ways of being uh, of going on a tour. We have uh, scheduled tours which leave uh, and those times that the scheduled tours leave uh, are posted on the web page. And you don't have to make a reservation for those. You just show up at the scheduled time and the docent takes you on a tour. There are, however, sometimes groups uh, which ask for special tours and right now, uh, we're limiting the size of the groups to five or six people, just given the COVID-19 uh, restrictions that we have. And if your group is larger, uh, we break it. For example, uh, there is a group of university women who I think are 10 or 12. Uh, I'm giving them tours on two separate days so that we can keep the groups small. And you can picnic here in the garden. Uh, the city has allowed picnicking to occur. We have picnic tables scattered throughout the garden. And so you might like to come and uh, go on a tour or picnic early and then go on the tour afterward. So you can either schedule a tour and uh, I think there's a charge for the scheduled tour or you can just join the tour at the times that they are already pre-scheduled. Okay, next question. Are any special precautions necessary to prevent hybridization of the various species? Yeah. So that's a really, really important question. So one of the problems we have is that when a plant dies uh, or is near death, uh, how do we continue to propagate that plant? Do we try to get seeds from that plant or do we try to get seedlings that have germinated? Uh, this is a, an issue which we have to deal with. And in that case, if the plant is able to self, that means to fertilize itself, what the horticulturist will do is when it flowers, they will actually cover up the flower with a bag and pollinate it themselves to make sure 
that it is uh, the true breeding species and doesn't outcross with something which would then dilute down the genetics of the particular plant. So it's something we're very concerned about and it's an issue which we have to deal with quite frequently. Uh, what do you say? Hold on. One minute. Uh, do you have a seed storage or repository to protect against disasters like fires? Right. So this is a really, really good question. We have here uh, a large seed storage facility in two freezers, and we have received a grant uh, from, uh, I'm not sure from the feds or from the state, to purchase two more freezers uh, in which we put our seeds. And I'll go back to that in a moment. And we also have exchanges with other botanical gardens located more distant from us, for example, out of, a fire, out of our fire zone, where we also have duplicates of our seeds, which we keep. And likewise, we keep duplicates of seeds from other areas here. Uh, the seed storage facility is an area that we are actively trying to expand on. As I said, we're gonna get two new freezers. Part of our problem right now, and many of you have experienced this yourselves, is that with the electricity uh, going off because of fires, we uh, risk the danger of having the freezers defrost. And so what we are doing is trying to develop uh, some backup electrical systems. They are expensive and we're trying to raise funds now for developing these backup systems for our seed storage facilities. But the question you asked is a very important question and uh, it is uh, one which we're addressing, but we're really behind the times when you compare how we store our seeds uh, how safely we store them to something like the Huntington Garden, which has several different backups. They don't just have a generator. They may have liquid nitrogen or some other source. We are behind the times. We, we have a gas generator which runs out of gas after a couple of hours. Okay. I have two questions about volunteering. The first one is says, may one volunteer to help with an exposition or expedition, excuse me. Yeah, well, that's a good question. I uh, suppose what has to happen is that the individual who is heading the expedition would have to be contacted. Uh, so I can't answer that because I think it's probably expedition specific, uh, but it's a really, I think it would be really a lot of fun to tell you the truth. Certainly you could volunteer for some of these activities like for example, the planting on Mount Diablo or Mount Tamalpais. That would certainly uh, qualify in some minds for an expedition. Okay. And uh, Cora Lee, who apparently wants to go to South America, says, are, or asks, are volunteers needed to collect plants in Chile or, per, or Peru? You, you, legally, you cannot do that. Uh, legally, any plant brought back into the country has to meet certain, um, uh, there are restrictions and there are certain approvals that have to be gotten from the governments. So usually when that happens, uh, we have to deny uh, putting those plants here in the garden because we would get ourselves in trouble if, if we had them here. Okay. Uh, from Amy, she says, I'm reading a book called Magdalena River of Dreams by a botanist named Wade Davis. It's about the great Magdalena River in Colombia, which runs from the mountains to the Caribbean. Do you have a section of plants, excuse me, uh, from the Cordillera or Yana of Colombia? And great pres presentation, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, I, I, I'm not sure that I can say whether we have plans from the Magdalena. We have a large South American collection. And for the individual who asked that question, what I'd suggest is if they know some of the plants that they were reading about, the names, to go online, look at our webpage and see if we have those plants growing here in the garden. And that webpage will indicate whether the plants were here and also where they're located in the garden. So you could come and maybe experience firsthand what the author is talking about in the book. Susan's asking, which plants are most important to our survival? Good question. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, uh, we depend upon plants to renew the atmosphere, oxygen, or we have to breathe, uh, although many other organisms make oxygen. So I would probably say for most of us, the plants that we're concerned about are the ones which uh, provide our foods. And uh, I didn't touch on this, but we have a large section of the garden developed called the, the garden uh, plants of mankind. And those are plants really, which we use as demonstration plants for, for young school children to let them see what the plant look like, looks like from which they get their foods. And many times adults, for example, many of you may not know where amaranth, the grain amaranth comes from. We have amaranth plants. So 
probably for most of us, we think or we should think of plants as the important part being food. But there are so many other uses of plants, their beauty, the solace they give us, the oxygen atmosphere, um, the medicines which we get from them. So it's hard to pick out one aspect. I think uh, by choosing only one, uh, we would imperil, imperil ourselves by, uh, by ignoring the other groups. Uh, Joyce is asking, is part of the goal to repopulate the original habitats with extinct plants such as the, cy the cycads? Well, uh, with the cycads, uh, because they are mostly grown uh, outside the United States, in South Africa in particular, and in Australia, we really have little control over them. But I can say that uh, many of the individuals here at the Botanical Garden who are interested in the cycads have co connections with individuals in these other countries. And uh, we have uh, a number of the cycads which make seeds. The seeds are large, they're often red in color, and uh, there is the possibility of seed exchange of reintroducing plants. But we really ourselves are not involved because of permits and because of local laws in the reintroduction of plants in other countries. Okay, um, I'm, I'm not sure what this means because I'm a novice, but what are the SJ specialties of botany? I'm not sure what SJ means either. <laughs> All right, well, we'll go to the next one. Um, you can have that, have that person write me. I'd be loved to, if, once I understood the question, I'd be glad to answer it. Yes, if you could re-ask the question, that would be great. Do you offer advice for ailing plants, i.e. what to do if the top of your redwood tree begins to die? Yeah, yeah. So this is a very common question that we get, uh, which is, uh, my plant is sick, uh, what, what can I do about it? And sometimes I can help them, but um, uh, often uh, the diagnostic work is, you need a, a deep diagnostic work. And what I can say is that prior to the COVID-19 times, we had a plant clinic here uh, at the garden held once a month. And uh, you could um, uh, bring a, a sample of the plant in or bring the characteristic or to the attention of the individuals manning this plant clinic, and they would give you a diagnosis. I think at this point, uh, what I would say is if you have uh, a plant which is suffering from some type of uh, disease or your deficiency, uh, feel free to write me. Uh, often I can then direct your question to a, a person who's an expert or by chance, and only by chance, I might know what an answer is. For example, uh, one of the things I teach about in Biology 1B is that for most of the students in dormitory rooms, the main reasons their plant doesn't, do, plants don't look very good is not, uh, is not if, if the light is okay and the watering is okay, is because they've run out of uh, fertilizer, run out of food. And by looking at the plant, uh, and I'm familiar with this and others are as well, I can tell you what deficiency might be missing from the fertilizer regime. So on the chance that I might know something, send me the uh, pictures or send me uh, some of the characteristics. And if I don't know it, I'll see if I can track it down for you. Dr. Feldman, what's your email address? ljfeldman at berkeley.edu. And there are a lot of Feldmans here, so make sure you put the LJ on, or the other ones refuse to forward my email anymore because they got too many questions from my 750 Bio-1B students. There you go. George asks, how is the garden protected against wildfires? Yeah, this. so we have a disaster preparedness committee, and right now, I think we are concerned about wildfires. Uh, we, uh, some of you may know the campus is divided into the central campus and then the region the garden is located in which includes the Lawrence Hall of Science and the LBL labs is called the Hill Campus. And uh, we have active uh, work um, among all the participants in the Hill Campus to try and mitigate fire. For those of you who have been up to the Botanical Garden in the past year or driven on Centennial Drive, you'll notice that there were a tremendous number of eucalyptus which were cut down. And so that's one of the fire mitigation uh, techniques which have been used. Uh, we also have um, trying to develop a, um, uh, a green belt uh, outside the fence of the garden to limit water. We have an irrigation system. And I might wanna point out to you that when the fires uh, occurred in Napa and around the wine country, that one of the things that kept the fire from spreading into uh, the cities 
was because of the vineyards, which were well watered and uh, which were therefore moist. And in a sense, the garden represents a buffer uh, to the whole campus below us uh, by representing this buffer of green. And right now, I think I can say to you is that we're worried about this. We are aware that there uh, traditionally strawberry canyon has burned and uh, we are trying to develop uh, backup plans which include um, water tanks and other types of ways of mitigating the fire, but we're not there yet. Okay. Deborah would like to know if um, you have volunteers who assist with removing storing seeds and if so, must they have a botanical background? Yes, we have volunteers who participate in seed cleaning, in uh, growing the plants from the seed and in storing the seeds. And if any of you are interested in that activity, you don't have to have a botanical background. Uh, I'll put you right to me and I'll put you in contact with the individual who actually heads and runs that activity. Okay. Keith is asking, as a campus resource garden that was primarily for studying botany, do you still feel that students majoring in the plant sciences or biology are your primary clientele? Well, I, I um, having been a faculty member for so long uh, on campus, I would say that um, it's important that any activity which goes on on campus, including the research activities, have a, a component which brings in students. Uh, the undergraduates at Berkeley are a truly remarkable resource, a truly remarkable group, and the campus wants to uh, reward them uh, by allowing them to become in involved in research activities. So the answer is that uh, our clientele has to involve uh, undergraduates, but they aren't our sole clientele. Because most of our funds come from outside, because we don't have large research grants, we have to also develop a clientele of donors and of individuals who have in their hearts uh, the, the strong feeling that they wanna support this garden. So the answer is students are very important, education is very important, but it's not enough to sustain the garden. And um, Dr. Feldman, how can people become members or donate? Yeah, so um, the, the webpage uh, has these resources. You can donate online. Uh, the uh, campus uh, office, which is called UDAR, which accepts gifts. Uh, people transfer stock. Uh, they make donations to the garden. And our webpage discusses all the various ways in which you can donate to the garden. We have about uh, 40, it's getting on to about 4,300 members of the garden. And you can become a member again uh, by doing this online. And there are various levels of membership and one of the things I want to point out about membership in the UC Botanical Garden is that by becoming a member, uh, you have reciprocal entrance to many other gardens, not only in California, but throughout the United States when travel again is open, and also uh, to other museums uh, in California using your Botanical Garden, UC Berkeley Botanical Garden uh, card. So the answer is uh, memberships can be easily obtained. Uh, they're great to give as a gift. Uh, many people give them Christmas time is a gift and they are uh, much appreciated. They really help the Botanical Garden and they provide us with um, a way of getting our message out to people. Final question, which does have, has nothing to do with membership. Regarding the ARC, are you propagating pallid manzanitas, tiny populations? I'm assuming they mean there are tiny no, populations. No, I don't know. I, I will be glad. Have that person write me, and I will be glad to find out. So we have um, a group of about 35 or 40 of the docents. They are called volunteer propagators. And if you come to the garden and you want a behind-the-scenes tour, I'll show you some of the areas. We have individuals who are in, interested in, in uh, growing only insectivorous plants, like Venus flytraps, which, by the way, if you're interested in insectivorous plants, uh, this Saturday morning and this Sunday morning, we're having a special sale on insectivorous plants here at the garden, I think from 10 until noon on both of those days. We have individuals who are interested only in California natives. We have some people who are interested in ferns. Some people who are interested only in trees and shrubs. Some people who are interested only in succulents and cacti. So if you have an interest in a particular group of plants uh, and you want to be a propagator, they are, would welcome you. Uh, so I want to say there are great opportunities. It's a wonderful way of meeting new people. 
And most importantly for me, it's a wonderful way of you experiencing the garden uh, in, a, in a very, uh, very real way. You're actually contributing to running the garden. Yeah. And I, I'd like to say that a couple of people have mentioned the, how wonderful the shop is. And personally, I've been to the shop. It's a great place to buy plants. Yeah. It's, a, it's a, a wonderful place to get a gift. It's, it's really almost worth the trip. Yeah, and, and along those lines, I want to tell you that after much haggling with the university, and for those of you who have been associated with the university, you know what haggling means. We now have put the shop online. So many of the items that you may not be able to see, although we have the shop, it's now allowed to be open based on university guidelines, but many of the items uh, can be purchased or ordered uh, by going to the online section uh, of the webpage. So we've tried to make it easier. And thank you, uh, Betsy, for that, that sort of plug, because it is a very, very unusual shop as far as the cards that they have and the items which they stock. Ah, and uh, Keith posted in the website, botanicalgarden.berkeley.edu and slash membership, if yes. you want a membership or, or That's not. Great. That's great. Thank, well, you. thank I, you. Dr. Feldman, I really want to thank you for being with us today. It's a wonderful presentation. We've gone through all the questions. And so, and thank you all for, thank you. Oh, we've also had many people say, thank you for the presentation. It's a wonderful presentation. Great. So I just want you to know that. Dr. Well, I appreciate it. And make sure if you come up here that you let me know, because meeting the public is a really important part for me. Great. Okay. Nice Any to know you're a people person and a plant person. <laughs> I'm not sure which is first. Well, that's right, right. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you all for joining us today, and we hope you'll join us on December 4th for our next presentation.